Dr. Dr. Dannenberg. Dr. Dannenberg, um, can you do me a small favor and just kind of give us a quick introduction to you, to you? And then okay. we can kind of, and, and what I'm going to do, I'm going to make sure everybody's muted uh, in the background. Um, and then I think everybody is, can you, can, uh, looks like everybody's pretty much, there's a few non-muted people, I think. No, it looks like everyone's pretty much muted. So if you're not muted, mute yourself, except for Dr. Dannenberg. All right, so anyway, welcome Dr. Dannenberg. It's a pleasure having you here. Um, I want to give you a moment just to, just to introduce yourself, um, if you don't mind, and then uh, sure. we'll get going from there. Okay, so basically, I am a periodontist. I've been in practice for 44 years. I stopped practice actually in September 2018. Um, not necessarily because I wanted to, but because I had a medical condition that just popped up. In September, well, in April of 2018, I was really healthy. I was lecturing, writing, consulting. I was traveling um, to Austin, Texas for, uh, I was a speaker at Paleo FX. I was talking on um, anti-inflammatory, nutrient-dense foods, primal lifestyle, and integrating it in my periodontal therapy. Um, while traveling, I got uh, a sore right shoulder while I was carrying my bags, um, did my seminar, came back to Charleston, didn't go away, kind of went from my shoulder to my back to my chest. And by August, I decided <laughs> finally <laughs> to go to my physician and figure out what went wrong or what was going on. I, something was happening with my rotator cuff or something like that. He um, didn't see anything other than the soreness I explained and he took some blood tests and the only thing that was abnormal was a high C-reactive protein. Took an MRI to see what was going on and he and I had a discussion and he thought I had either lymphoma, leukemia or multiple myeloma. Mind you, I've been basically amazingly healthy until that point, at least as far as I could tell. We got an oncologist. He did a PET scan. There was a mass on the side of my spine, um, did a CT biopsy, a variety of tests. Turns out that I had um, IgA capillate chain multiple myeloma, which is incurable. It was an aggressive form, and I had lytic lesions or holes throughout my bone um, structure, entire skeleton. And he gave me five, four, uh, three to six months to live if I did nothing. He suggested chemotherapy, but he explained that it would not stop the disease. I may be going into remission, but I would get the, the uh, cancer again. He was going to do more aggressive chemo. That occurred because the previous chemo wouldn't work any longer. And along the way, I would have a decrease in quality of life until I died from the complications of multiple myeloma. That didn't make sense to me. So making a long story short, I did a lot of uh, independent research. I created my own um, unconventional cancer protocols, which I started right away, uh, right after my diagnosis, which was September 2018. And I have been continuing that, although I've tweaked it significantly many, many times since then. Um, basically, I was eating a paleo diet, had my other protocols, we can go into it in detail later on, to support my overall health. I changed from a paleo diet to a carnivore diet on January 1st, 2020. Um, I was doing some very specific, newly approved immunotherapy um, that I started in... Uh, maybe October, September of 2019 um, to try to kill just cancer cells. And I just had a PET scan a week and a half ago. And my oncologist called me and he said, sit down, make sure your wife is listening. There are no active cancer cells throughout your body. Amazing. I mean, amazing, right? This is an incurable disease, and I thought I was going to die by December 2018. Here it is, May 2020, and I feel fantastic. So that's a, a nutshell of a summary of my story. Um, 
I mean, that's great news to hear. I mean, it's wonderful. I'm sure you're, you're pretty excited about that. So, I mean, lytic lesions, did they check for lytic lesions? How did they, how did, when they said no signs yeah, of so, active disease? So the lytic lesions, up? the lytic lesions at my diagnosis were innumerable. So basically the radiologist couldn't even count the number. And you know, when they, you diagnose multiple myeloma, Part of the diagnosis is maybe one lytic lesion, two lytic, lytic lesions, five lytic lesions. My entire skeleton is peppered with holes everywhere. So when we did the new PET scan, it did continue to show the lytic lesions. However, there were no cancer cells to take up the radioactive glucose throughout my body and the PET scan was from head to toe. So they looked at everything. That is a good sign. Now it takes time for these other lesions to maybe remineralize, um, have a variety of things that I do unconventionally as well as targeted um, to support my bone. Maybe that will st strengthen as time by, but I am in danger at a high risk of pathological fractures. Unfortunately, I have had many. That really has my most serious problem. Um, I have had two vertebrae compression fractures, a, a fracture in my pelvis, um, a couple broken ribs, a completely fractured right humerus, a completely fractured right femur, a partially fractured left femur, um, most of my bones have been fractured and repaired, but I am doing amazingly well. Um, I can get up and walk, and I, do, I walk a mile every day or every other day. I do some push-ups, modified push-ups, modified squats in the house. I am getting around, and I am doing what I think I can do to literally get my body as in as much health as I can and physical fitness. Yeah, and I think that's wonderful. Dr. Danberg, remind me, how old are you again? I'm 73. I am 70. an old fart. <laughs> yeah. So I mean that. that I mean, I'm, I'm just, I'm just putting that out there for the folks that are sort of oh, lamenting sure. that they, they, they can't exercise. You're 73. Who had a bunch of broken bones and lytic lesions and came oh, recent cancer diagnosis, and you're out there exercising. And I, and, and, I, and I have, and I have two titanium bars on my right and left femur just so I can walk. It would be interesting to see what I would ha what ha would happen if I went through an airport screening um, machine these days. Yeah, well, I can't sure fly, so you'd set no off problem. the metal deflect the detectors. Undoubtedly. I th I think so. Yeah. So let me just because I mean, there's people that say you know you started a novel anti-cancer drug as well. I want to know more about that because there's people who say, well, that sure. certainly may be the cause of your oh, remission well, and not dying. So well, okay. Now, first of all, okay, I'll go over that. I have a very um, intricate, integrated set of protocols that I believe have gotten me to where I was and, and am today. My immunotherapy is a recent adjunct to that and is doing fairly well, except for the pathological fractures with blood chemistry. They were staying stable. They were not getting worse. And mind you, my, diagnos my prognosis was three to six months to live on September 2018. And so with my protocols, without the immunotherapy, I was stable. So because of the pathological fractures, we wanted to do something that was a newly uh, approved drug by the FDA. So immunotherapy is not chemotherapy. This is a, a human-derived monoclonal antibody called Darzalex, which actually attacks CD38 um, protein on malignant plasma cells. The purpose of this um, monoclonal antibody is to make that malignant plasma cell either kill itself by apoptosis or create a reaction in the immune system to stimulate macrophages to come to the area to gobble up these cancer cells. Now, Without a doubt, that is helping. However, the statistics for Darzalex, number one, you can't do Darzalex unless you have failed with other chemotherapy drugs. 
I got around that with a number of, of uh, problems, especially I developed some clots in my body that contradicts other chemotherapy drugs. So I was never on chemotherapy drugs. But when people are on Doxalexis because they have failed everything else, and the individuals that do get on Darzalex, only 1% become cancer-free. Now, I'm only cancer-free for two weeks, maybe. So we'll have to have this conversation five years from now, maybe. But the statistics are sad with Darzalex. They extend life, but they don't create a cancer-free or cure environment. Um, I am of the opinion because of what I am doing and what I am doing right now is critical, the carnivore diet. We can talk about the medical research about carnivore diet and cancer, especially from the um, Paleo Medicina Clinic in Budapest, Hungary. Um, I am extremely uh, vigilant in maintaining a very, very healthy gut microbiome, mucus layer, epithelial barrier layer. Um, I do other supportive herbal med, um, ab, ab, um, extracts for supporting my immune system. I do a variety of unconventional, um, not prescription drugs to improve my bone metabolism. So I do believe all of these play a significant role. And I am pretty healthy compared to, theoretically, my risk. I'll give you an example if you have another moment. Um, maybe three months ago when I saw my oncologist, before the COVID issue that we have today, um, he and his uh, physician's assistant had a very severe case of the flu. They had masks on. They were sneezing. They were drooling. Mind you, uh, most of the staff in the hospital also had the flu. Mind you, everyone that works in the hospital must take the flu shot, just to give you an idea of how effective that flu shot was. So they had the flu. My concern was, here I am in a doctor's office, two people have a very severe case of the flu, and my resistance to infection, theoretically, is the pit. So I'm thinking I'm going to get sick, but I never get sick. And I don't get sick. And I think that is because of what I am doing that supports my gut and my immune system and everything else uh, that goes along with that. But so, so what I'm doing with the immunotherapy is very specific for the plasma cancer cells. Without a question, it is a factor in my healing, but it is not the only factor. And my oncologist is pretty impressed because none of his other patients that are on Dozolex are getting the result that I'm getting. Of course, all of his patients, when I go to the, the cancer clinic, Dozolex is an infusion, and I was getting it every two weeks for, for a while. Um, so I go to the cancer clinic, and pa patients that are on infusions are in the same room that I am in, and the nurses are serving chocolate cookies to these patients. So the concept of diet and cancer therapy is so misplaced today. And obviously, I didn't take a bite of the chocolate chip cookie. So yes, immunotherapy is helping, helping but it's only one of my protocols. When... Um... What is the spontaneous remission rate for uh, multiple myeloma or specifically the, the, the variety that you have to use? Is there any stats published on that? Because there's, you know, people will say, well, sometimes, it, it, you know, there's spontaneous remissions and then a lot of people will, you know, they'll consider a, a cancer cure. You know, this is your five year, five year, pro, you know, five years of without disease equals cured. I mean, obviously you're very early on in this. Uh, do we know anything about spontaneous cures or, or remissions rather? I am sure I've read that somewhere, but I, I can't put my finger on it. I do know that it is um, termed an incurable cancer. Um, because of that, I had no problem um, enlisting in uh, hospice, which I was in hospice, uh, because of severe pain management. Actually, I was at a point in August of 2019 where I thought I was ready to die. So I, I really have gone from that state of um, 
almost death to the state where I am today, which I think is quite amazing. There is yeah, no, I, mean, I don't, I have not read spontaneous remission, but I have heard of longevity up to seven to 10 years, but there are many, many forms of multiple myeloma and mine is a more advanced stage, especially yeah. with the lytic lesions. Yeah, the sure. That and I, I have lytic lesions are severe. One of the ways when I was in medical school, we learned about multiple amyloma. One of the pathognomonic uh, ways of diagnosis was, you know, getting a whole body bones, a skeletal survey. Basically, we would do that, and we would just see lytic lesions, and that would be pretty, pretty pathognomonic for uh, uh, multiple myeloma. What you know, you you, you alluded to cancer research and diet in, in the paleo medicine group and certainly we're, we're most of us are familiar with those guys in fact i think we've got Sophia Clemens coming on to talk to us again here in the next few weeks but let me you know whenever we talk about cancer and anything outside of chemotherapy radiation or or, or surgery um it's considered taboo how dare you discuss nutrition in the in the realm of this disease because this disease is special and i always look at that and i say why would it not make an why would it not make why would it not have a factor maybe it's not completely curative and as you say you use it as part of a uh, a regimen and there is some literature out there that's becoming you know more and more looked at with uh, you know uh, ketogenic diets in particular so what do you what are you talking about when you say diet and cancer. Let's hear what your thoughts are on that. Well, first of all, um, I go uh, into some research and I've researched and I know you know Thomas Seafried um, and his not much, much more than just theories that cancer is not a disease of a genetic uh, deformity. Cancer is a disease of metabolic and mitochondrial dysfunction. And, so, and that's an epigenic problem. You know, if you go back into uh, archaeology, not archaeology, um, um, researching the archaeological digs of primal societies and skeletal remains and do some nitrogen testing and a, a variety of other testing, you will see that these, um, these peoples did not have cancer, or they rarely ever had cancer. If you look at primal societies that are in existence today, cancer is an extremely rare chronic disease. If you look at the United States and the incidence of or prevalence of, of chronic disease and cancer, it's right up there. And the reason is an epigenetic factor, which is basically our food, our lifestyle, our chemicals, all the stuff that affect our metabolism and specifically our mitochondria. And so if I can enhance my metabolism and my mitochondria by putting the things in my body that my body really requires, and for the most part, eliminating or reducing um, the elements, the toxic elements that my body has a problem with, I can and hopefully repair my mitochondria and support my metabolism so that I can starve out these cancer cells. And that's what hey, I do. Dr. Danberg, let me, let me just interject before you get too far into this. I mean, one, one thing you stated was, you know, we look at, uh, you know, anthropologic records and we look at this, the skeletons and we see a rarity of, you know, these lytic lesions, these, these cancerous things. It's not that they're unheard of, but they're very rare. Um, many people will counter that argument and says, well, these people only had a life expectancy of 40, and therefore they didn't get old enough to, to get cancer. What, 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 what do you say about that? Well, it's a very interesting. Also, when you look at that, when th that may be that the average age of these people dying is very low, once they got to the age of 40, they actually lived a long time into their 60s and 70s. Not a lot of people got to that age because they were killed by um, warring factions or animals that ate them or they fell off a cliff of some uh, uh, structure or they had infections that got their bodies to a point where they succumbed. So the studies show that once they reach the age of 30 or 40, those that were resistant or healthier or 
wasn't weren't killed because of um, other factors could survive to the age of, for the most part, our life expectancy. So um, th that's that is a counter to what you're saying. However, cancers are in people from all age groups. You know that, and so the fact that uh, even they were young and they didn't have the cancerous lesions uh, doesn't necessarily mean because they are young they don't have cancer. Yet there are primal societies today that are living into their 70s that don't have cancer. And why do we have such a high prevalence of cancer in a westernized society with all of our uh, contributing factors and the primal societies that don't have the contributing factors don't have cancer? Uh, I'm not here to fight the fight of an argument, why do I, why am I getting healthy? But I will tell you, I know for sure that my environment has a lot to do with it. I can tell you why I think I have cancer today. Um, if you want me to get into that right now. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you want to share that, that's, that's, that would be certainly uh, I think worth mentioning. Absolutely. Okay, so basically I'm a dentist and I went to dental school in the early 1970s. And one of the things that is very interesting about my cancer, which is a cancer of my plasma cells and my bone marrow, is that plasma cells are extremely susceptible to low dose ionizing radiation. Um, low dose ionizing radiation are basically dental x-rays. And when I was in dental school in those days, I was there for four years as a dent to, to become a dentist and then another two years to specialize in periodontics. So four continuous years in the clinic and where I was in that school, it was a, a unique environment in those days because the clinic was set up where four dental students were in their own modules, like a dental office. They had their own modules. Patients came to them in their own modules. And, eat, and the four of us shared a dental x-ray. And we had about 120 dental students in the school. So there were many, many dental x-ray machines in this clinic. And unfortunately, you know, when a machine run, a dental, an x-ray machine runs, it doesn't make any sound or or, or a, there's no odor, there's no um, visual uh, identification that you're having x-rays beaming through the, through the air. So I don't know how well I was protected. I didn't have protective gear on me in those days. I didn't have a, a, um, uh, an, a badge that would be um, uh, affected and would tell somebody that I had a higher dose than I should have. So I could have been exposed to ionizing radiation on a regular basis for four conti uh, six continuous years. That's one thing. The other thing is that when we are dentists and we learn to place fillings in teeth, these are mercury-based fillings. So mercury-based fillings are pretty unhealthy. Mercury is a, a neurotoxin and it obviously is extremely unhealthy. So I was working with free mercury like every dental student for all those four years and the, the, the weird thing is when we mix these filling materials we actually have to squeeze out the excess free mercury in this in this conglomeration an amalgam and we throw these pellets of free mercury on the floor. And when we do that, um, this mercury vaporizes. The dental school was probably the most toxic environment you can imagine. So the exposure to free mercury continuously and the exposure to ionizing radiation continuously probably damaged one plasma cell in my body so that it didn't self-die, didn't commit suicide, didn't, uh, didn't, uh, was not affected by apoptosis, and it survived and started to multiply. And because of my lifestyle and diet, especially over the last six, seven years, I was able to prevent the clinical manifestation of this cancer uh, until it was overwhelming. So I believe that's the cause. And there was a study that was published in 2014 that actually 
looked at a cohort of male dentists, my age group, 55 to 75, compared to the average male of 55 to 75, and that dental cohort of my age group had a significantly higher risk of cancer, specifically multiple myeloma, than the general male population of my age group. They didn't, in that paper, describe why, but I believe the reasons were what I just told you, the free mercury and the uh, ionizing radi radiation. Yeah, I mean, and certainly that, that I don't doubt that that could have contributed to or been maybe a primary factor. I mean, there's, you know, obviously there's a lot of things. But how did, I mean, when we look at, you know, because you're talking about cancer as a metabolic disease, uh, and, you know, you, you know, do you think like Thomas Safry's work and, and some of the other people that have sort of replicated what he's doing? Um, how does that jive with the ionizing radiation? Does it damage the mitochondria? And then the other yeah. question becomes... Yeah, so the, um, absolutely. Yeah, the ionizing radiation affects the mitochondria and the DNA. You know, there were, there were two rat studies that were done in uh, years ago, I think that where the researchers took a um, telephone, a mobile telephone, and they placed it in this rat, these rat cages, turning it on for eight hours like it would be in your pocket, and off for the other uh, 16 hours or whatever. And they did it for a continuous, uh, for, for a year. And then they compared the control group and the experimental group of these rats, and it turned out that the rats that were exposed to this um, electromagnetic field radiation from the, the cell phone actually developed a significantly higher level of lymphoma, whereas the control group didn't develop the, the cancer. So th that is a factor. There are a variety of studies that, sh that were done after the atomic bomb was dropped and the Chernobyl event when they started to research the individuals after the radiation exposures, they found out that not only were there serious radiation um, factors uh, affecting DNA cells and cause a variety of cancers, but over time, the lower dose radiation that was in plants and other structures affected other individuals later on to develop cancers. Um, there is some great research that shows that if you can all get the dirty electromagnetic fields and ionizing radiation, which is in an entirely different area of the electromagnetic um, uh, string of events, that you can repair the mitochondria and uh, support um, a healthier environment. The sad, is, the sad part is, if the DNA is damaged, it will not only not repair, it will re replicate through uh, um, uh, generation to generation. So that, that is a significant problem. Yeah, one of the things when I, when I interviewed Thomas Seyfried, he talked about that, you know, the DNA damage is often downstream from the mitochondrial insult. And so the, the, one of the confusing factors is we see many cancers do have you know dna damage somatic dna damage and therefore they can they, they assume that that is a primary event or is your you i would assume you're saying that is maybe a secondary event or a possibly parallel event but the cause of thing is occurring at the metabolic level from the mitochondria is that is that fair to say the, the majority of cancers that i think are in existence today are diseases of metabolic and mitochondrial dysfunction if you are exposed to seriously high or long low dose radiation, long exposure to low dose radiation, I think that is a different effect causing the DNA, and that genetic damage also has damaged the mitochondria, and you're literally destroying the cell, and therefore you're getting um, the malignancy from both ends, the mitochondrial dysfunction and the genetic damage. Let's, let me talk a little bit more specifically on, you know, because within the carnivore diet spectrum, there's a, there's a bit of a diff, different, uh, different approaches. You know, some people include dairy. Some people will include a little bit of spices and a few plant foods. Some people will go with 
uh, a very high fat ratio. Some people will have a more moderate or even higher protein approach. With regard to your, your protocol, with, with the goal, you know, I, I assume the, the main obvious goal is to mitigate reverse and hopefully be in complete remission long term for cancer. How are you approaching that? So there are several factors here, and that one of the factors is um, basically chronic systemic inflammation. So we need to reduce chronic systemic inflammation. There are many papers that have been published that show that chronic systemic inflammation is a causal factor of variety of malignancies. I, I, there, there are many that have been recently published, but many older papers too. So chronic systemic inflammation is a, a problem when the gut barrier epithelium um, is breaking down and, it's, and it is involved with increased um, permeability and le le uh, leakage of lipopolysaccharides in the lumen, which is natural in the lumen, get into the bloodstream, creating an immune response and what's called metabolic endotoxemia. Metabolic endotoxemia is critical in that it affects every organ system. That is probably the cause of chronic diseases today, as well as cancer, as well as periodontal disease, which is what I treat. So, so my concern is to make sure this epithelial barrier of the, gut, my, uh, of the gut is intact. So I need to make sure my microbiome is healthy, my mucus layer is healthy. And um, a carnivore diet eliminates the uh, anti-nutrients, specifically phytates and lectins and oxalates that are so damaging to the epithelial barrier, creating this leaky gut. So one of the huge benefits of the carnivore diet is to repair the epithelial barrier to prevent metabolic endotoxemia. That would be a, a critical part. Um, as you know, you're going to get all the nutrients that you need. And basically, what I also want to do is to put my body into to a state of ketosis the majority of the time because I can possibly starve some of these um, malignant cancer cells. Now, as you know, glucose is just one of the foods of a cancer cell. So glutamine is another food that we can't remove because we need it for a variety of other bodily functions. So, but if I can reduce this glucose level um, and be a fat burner and a ketone user, uh, since all my other cells are going to use ketones, and if they need glucose, gluconeogenesis is well and uh, alive and well in my body, so it'll take care of that. So I want that fat level to a point where I can be in ketosis for the majority of the time, and that will be a two to one gram, two to one level of fat to protein. And that's what I try to do. I don't do um, dairy for a variety of reasons, but you know that the casein in dairy mimics gluten in many respects, and it can be an irritant to the gut membrane. So I don't do dairy. I am not lactose intolerant, but I just don't do dairy. Uh, and, and again, my foods are designed to give me a fat to protein ratio of two to one or better. Yeah, so that would be, that would be this, this sort of PKD ratio that you're Pretty about. much, um, yeah. There's some data in the literature showing saturated fat can lead to LPS uh, endotoxemia. What are your thoughts on I that? I disagree with that. You I disagree think that, that the studies exist or you disagree with the No, no, I know the studies exist. I think that they are um, maybe uh, exaggerated in, in one way or another and not as pure as you like them to be. I, I believe, and what I've seen in saturated fat that is from animals that are grass-fed is totally different than the saturated fat from animals that are um, grain-fed, which is the majority of the studies that are done. Also, I, we need to be aware of it's just not one element that causes any disease. So if you have saturated fats and they are LPS is attaching to them and it's leaking through the intestinal perm, uh, the increased intestinal um, layer, 
it's because the intestinal layer is not healthy. It's not because the saturated fat has created the problem. So we need to be able to understand that the gut must be healed and repaired and maintained. So to do that, you have to have the type of probiotics that not only create metabolites that are beneficial to the microbiome and a variety of other cells in the, in the gut, but you also have to have a probiotic that actually generates itself in the gut. And the only ones that do that, the only ones that do that are the spore-based probiotics. So I do spore-based probiotics. I do a variety of other things to maybe um, bind to the excess LPS that may be in my gut, lumen. I also support the mucus layer with other amino acids. And with all of that in play, I repair, or my body is repairing, the gut epithelial barrier. You know, the, the, the membrane, the epithelial membrane is the most regenerative structure in the entire human body. It regenerates, it repairs and replaces itself every three to five days. So if you don't insult that barrier constantly, that barrier repairs. So it's not a problem to repair your gut. The problem is you, we are eating one thing, let's say saturated fat, that we say is harmful, yet we're eating raw green kale and spinach, which are high in oxalates that are creating spears of crystals that perforate this epithelial barrier and will never let it heal. So we have to understand that there are so many elements to create health today. And what on the, uh, the corollary is we do so many things that are harmful to our body. We just can't do one good thing and expect all the bad things to be um, uh, negated at, at that point. We have to do a lot. I do not believe healthy saturated fat is a problem. As a matter of fact, saturated fat is the majority of the cell membrane. So I think those studies are flawed. Yeah. I, I, you know, I, I know I've talked to Ben Bickman and we've talked about this a couple of years ago, talking the fact that, you know, even when we have the LPS uh, we have a, a mechanism of clearing that through, I believe, LDL cholesterol uh, it participates in in removing that. So it's kind of a, it's kind of you have the counter agent to that. But I, I think that that discussion that you're having is relevant to more than just a carnivore diet because you're saying um, if we don't constantly insult our gut, we have a chance to you know kind of reach a level of repair. And you know people would argue that you know. 100 years ago, we didn't see the level of autoimmune disease. We didn't see the cancer rates. We didn't see the chronic disease rates. And if you're saying that, you know, it all starts in the gut or much of it starts in the gut, people might say that 100 years ago, people were eating a more variety, varied diet. Uh, and maybe there's something, there's, there's levels of insult and, and constant. And, you know, if you look at the modern diet, which, you know, doesn't even reflect what we ate 200 years ago. I mean, it's so much different. Is Do you think there's something to said to that, that, you know, people 100 years ago could eat meat, eggs, fish, uh, some dairy, and some fruit? Uh, so, so you're absolutely correct to a certain extent. The problems that we have are exponentially growing in the last um, 50 years, without a doubt. However, you can go back into some biblical times and see problems that were related to the grains th that were eaten in the days of the pharaohs. So the, the interesting thing is our bodies never were designed to eat certain processed foods, yet the processed foods were not a problem if they weren't consistent and continuous. And then now the processed foods that are not only continuous and consistent, they are they are tainted with a variety of chemicals, many of which we don't even know about, but they are certainly tainted with the agriculture chemicals like um, glyphosate and preservatives and dyes and all kinds of long scientific names that are on the uh, ingredient label that are damaging to our gut microbiome. And so, Yes, I agree with you. It is so much worse today, but 100 years ago, although they weren't 
significantly overweight, they were not healthy people. And the disease, diseases were still there. And if you go back 8,000, 5,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, there, there are some documented tablets that I had seen about 3,000 years ago that talked about celiac disease, not in the term celiac disease, but it was related to grains that were being farmed and processed. So um, our diets, we need to have a clean diet. And, and the, biggest pro the biggest benefit of a carnivore diet, in my mind, is that it just is the perfect elimination diet because it avoids all the plant foods that are potentially, not necessarily for everybody, but potentially uh, irritating to the gut membrane, even how it's prepared. So if you stop all the damage, get your gut to repair, get your body to repair, get the nutrients you need that you are getting with, with the meat and the organs and the fat and the collagenous material from animals that are properly raised without chemicals, then we can restore that body. And if you wanted to return to a different diet, then re reintroduce other foods that are not known to be toxic. Uh, and then I wouldn't have a problem with that. I don't, I'm, I'm not saying I'm gonna be on the carnivore diet for the rest of my life. But I think the carnivore diet right now is doing extremely well for me. I have no real problem with it. I can cheat, but when I cheat, it's not cheating with harmful foods. I might have a fruit or I might have some kind of a food that is plant derived, but it's not high in oxalates and it's hot, not high in lectins. So I'm going to try to put something into my body that is not going to be damaging to my body. And Dr. Jamber, can you just elaborate a little bit? Because a lot of people ask this question about the spore biotics. Can you specifically yes. talk about that a little bit more? Where you get them? Where where do they come from? So on and so yes. forth. Yes. Actually, I am a principal investigator of a study that is being done to investigate the spore-based probiotics and its benefit on periodontal health. So the spore-based probiotics are basically bacilli. Um, these are naturally occurring spores in organic soils that come from animals that defecate. And so these spores get onto the foods that we eat and they are resistant to cooking and we ingest them in the days where we ingested healthy foods from healthy soil um, on a regular basis. So there are companies that actually produce, they, they don't manufacture them per se, but they, they grow them or they produce them. And one of them is called Microbiome Labs, which is the, uh, one of the companies I use. And their product is called Megaspore Biotic, which is a combination of five bacillus spores. So these spores that you take either in a capsule form or you can eat the powder or mix it in a liquid if you don't like capsules, you literally ingest. What happens is the spores go through the stomach and the stomach acid does not damage the spore. The spores then go into the small and large intestine and they begin to repopulate. In addition, their metabolites are uh, uh, um, being produced to support the diversity and the, and the um, quality of other commensal bacteria. So you're getting the spores to reproduce and grow, and they'll do that for about 30 to 60 days, and then they kind of dissipate. That's why you have to continue to eat spores, just like you have to continue to eat food and breathe air. You can eat spores, and they are beneficial for the gut. Now, studies have been done where spore-based probiotics are compared to basically lactobacillus and bifidobacterium type um, um, uh, probiotics. And what has happened is both of these groups, the spore and the non-spore probiotics, produce numerous metabolites that are resistant to the stomach acid, get into the gut, and they do their job. But the lactobacillus and bifidobacterium type probiotics are killed in the stomach acid. The human stomach acid is around a pH of one to uh, or one to two. It's killed. 
So you do not get any regeneration of probiotics in the gut. There is a misconception that when you eat sauerkraut and fermented foods, these friendly bacteria get into your gut and grow. They don't because they're dead in the acid of the gut, uh, of the stomach. And if that stomach acid doesn't get it, the bile acids get it in the uh, duodenum before they get into the rest of the intestine. So, and it's not a bad thing because the metabolites are a huge factor, a beneficial factor of these probiotics. But the spores have another benefit, and that is they reproduce and they, and, and they support the microbiome in the gut as well as they make the metabolites that support the rest of the, the microbiome in the gut. So I, yeah, I get them from um, uh, Microbiome Labs. Another one a company is Enviromedica, which has a great product called Terraflora, which have another five different bacillus spores. Three of them are the same as megaspores, two of them are not. Interesting stuff. What are your, um, so just, you know, you've kind of touched on a couple of things. We just have a few minutes remaining. I just want to see what, you know, what is your overall I know you've got diet, you've got this immunotherapy drug that you're taking, you know, you've got these sports. Is there anything else you're including in this overall sure. lifestyle management to mitigate, uh, you know, this cancer? So the, the most important thing I think is diet. The second most important thing is the gut, and that's a lot there. The third thing is my immune system. Now, certainly the diet and the gut health support my immune system, but I add a little bit of um, extra effort to my immune system. I take three um, herbal extracts, astragalus, echinacea, and Korean ginseng. And I do that in extract form, not capsule or tablet form. Um, the capsules and tablets have so much junk in them, I'm not interested. So the extracts are pure. I mix them together and I take them on a daily basis. Um, those are the, the, would be the three. Now I do some um, effort with my um, bone metabolism. I do take vitamin D3, that's certainly that's part of my immune system protocol. I take vitamin K2, that's part of my immune system, my mo bone metabolism, as well as my um, gut protocol. So, uh, you know, a variety of things support in uh, other systems. But uh, the, the other things that I try to do is I, use pulsed electromagnetic field therapy on a daily basis. Actually, I have a regimen where I use my mat, my full body mat, uh, three to four times a day. Pulsed electromagnetic fields actually repair dysfunctional mitochondria. They improve the can calcium channeling as well as improve the millivoltage potential between the outside and inside of cells. So I think that's another important factor. I've been doing that all along. Um, and I do some exercise. Yeah, interesting stuff. Um, you know, what is, uh, so when your doctor, you know, when you had his recent revelation that, hey, no active disease, what was the, what was a sort of commentary from the physician? So I haven't seen him yet. He only called me on the phone last Friday, because this is all brand new. And you could tell, you, you know, you can tell when a person is smiling and laughing or upset. So he definitely was beaming. And he said, Al, make sure your wife gets on speakerphone. And he read the report. And then he said, you have no active cancer cells throughout your body. I said, wait a minute, George. Say this again. Say this again. Because I wanted to make sure I understood what he said. I have no active cancer cells throughout my body. My less, last PET scan was riddled with cancer cells everywhere. Now I had different areas that were more intense, but I had cancer cells everywhere. Um, so when I see him this coming Tuesday, or not this coming, but next Tuesday, he's going to be very happy and excited. He actually is a very conventional oncologist, but he is definitely on my page. He loves the materials. I, I, he, he asks for the abstracts of medical journals that I use with the carnivore diet and everything else. Um, he's very impressed, and I'm his only patient that has this result. And he's been around for a long time.
Well, uh, that's wonderful. And I assume you've got a, because we've got a, just a couple minutes left here, but you have a, a blog that you're keeping online so people sure. can follow what's going on. So I assume once you see the doctor, you'll probably update some more information as time goes. Where can people find out about that? Yes, I, I can be reached at drdannenberg.com. So it's D-R-D-A-N-E-N-B-E-R-G.com. And just go to the blog section. I write every week. Um, I talk about the gut, the oral microbiome, the uh, chronic diseases, as well as my cancer journey. So I've got 40 plus articles on my cancer journey starting from September 2008, 2018. Wonderful stuff. And just, uh, just briefly, does diet play a role in periodontal, periodontal health? Absolutely. So our primal ancestors didn't have periodontal disease either. And we know that from, from skeletal remains of the jaw. And the only reason is the dental plaque that you and I have, I want to make an emphasis here, is absolutely healthy until it's not healthy. The worst thing you can do is scrub your dental plaque off to the bare bone, theoretically. Uh, so when you go to the dental hygienist and they give you this red dye and then they teach you to scrub it off until you don't see any of the red dye is absolutely unhealthy because the biofilm of dental plaque is one of the healthy biofilms in the body. And your body's gut um, changes your immune system that causes the plaque to become unhealthy. And then bad food feed the bad bacteria in an unhealthy dental plaque that creates periodontal disease and tooth decay. That's, that's interesting, and I've not heard that before. But thanks for sharing that, because I know some people talk about they get a little bit of a buildup behind the front two teeth and the bottom, particularly on a carnivore diet, or, or I've heard that mentioned, and you're saying that there's healthy plaque and unhealthy plaque. And so that's Absolutely. Absolutely. And you don't want to remove healthy dental plaque. Interesting. All right. Well, Dr. Dannenberg, I unfortunately have to go to another meeting. This has been great. Thank you so much for being willing to share. Hey, it's my pleasure. I love it. And we look forward to your update. So, you know, maybe, maybe six months down the road when you're still kicking in your, your, you're doing great <laughs> stuff. You can come back and visit us. How's that sound? Actually, that'd be fantastic. I'm not going to compete with you athletically though, by the way, that's <laughs> okay, not going to happen. Fine. That's okay. You just improve. All right. Well, Thank well guys, you. I got to go. Thanks so much for bearing with me at the beginning there. Okay. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye Thanks, now. everybody.